The Starry Whites by Giulio Tsuka is the third chapter of the author's second novel, The Buddha in the Attic. Otsuka is an awarded Japanese American novelist, born in California in 1962, who specializes in historical fiction about experiences of Japanese immigrants in the first half of the 20th century. While her first novel, When the Emperor Was Divine, focused on the lives of Japanese immigrants in the American internment camps during World War II, her second novel goes back a few decades and tells the story of picture brides, young girls who had arranged marriages to Japanese men living in the United States right after the end of World War I. There is not a main character in the chapter and Otsuka follows numerous shared stories and experiences in the structure of a feminine we and us about girls who were tricked with promises of love and freedom each immigrating to the United States. This chapter is told through a stream of consciousness and the first person plural and it focuses on themes of prejudice, brutal working conditions, cultural differences, gender relations, and the se social and sexual submission that were expected of these girls from both their husbands and their male bosses. According to the Women in American History, a branch of the New York Historical Society, between 1907 and 1924, over 10,000 picture brides arrived in the United States from Japan. The motivation for these girls to leave their country is similar to that of many immigrants from other parts of the world who believed that America was a great and prosperous nation. In an interview for the Leonard Lopez show, the author explains that since Japan was a very poor nation at the time, many of the picture brides wanted a better life for themselves and thus agreed to marry men that, while Japanese, they had never met before. She said that most of them were poor girls from rural areas who had heard about the good life in America, especially because conditions were not good for women in Japan. They were seduced by the concept of the American dream and believed that the husbands were wealthy men who could support them in the Yankees land. But the men lied and the brides knew that if they were truthful, they would never have come to America. They were not sick traders, they were fruit, fruit pickers. They did not live in large, many roomed homes. They lived in tents and in barns and out of doors, in the fields beneath the sun and the stars. Because of this, these girls, instead of having the life that they dreamed of with sweet romances and a big house in an equal society, were faced with a nightmare instead. They were forced to work on open fields, harvesting potatoes under the 120 degrees of a California weather. Some of us wept while we worked. Some of us cursed while we worked. All of us ached while we worked. Our hands blistered and bled. Our knees burned. Our backs would never recover. They had no protections from work and dying or getting sick under the sunlight was not uncommon. They were taught to not complain by their husbands who threatened them if they didn't work. And they even wouldn't be able to complain because they didn't know English, because they didn't have time to learn. Water was one of the few words they knew and it was due to necessity. The American dream was as far from them as it was before they immigrated. But the American dream also involves learning this country's way of living, which was so foreign to them, or learning for women the appropriate behavior and lies of being born female. This was learned by the girls who worked as maids for suburban whites and who had their wives explain both house cleaning duties as well as the things that women had to accept and ignore from their husbands in order to survive. Some of these lessons were how to sound cheerful on the telephone when you were angry or sad, or how to wash a lipstick staying out of your husband's favorite white shirt even when the lipstick stain was not yours or even don't ask him where he's been or what time he'll be coming home and make sure he's happy in bed beyond learning japanese girls also had to be the white woman companion in all the needs that a husband or lover couldn't fulfill they had to spray them with compliments sleep in their beds when their husbands were not home and lie for them However, the girls were never their friends or close to these women because they were still in the margins of society and were sustained for being immigrants and Asian. The American dream also promises freedom and the picture brides were not allowed to be free. They didn't have control of their choices or their bodies. Many of them were victims of sexual assault, either by their bosses on the fields, or by a husband's friends, or by the suburban's husbands. 
Nobody has to know, he would say to us. Or, she's not home and too late. And when he led us upstairs to the bedroom and laid us across the bed, the very same bed we had made up that morning, we wept because it had been so long since we had been held. These girls were so lonely and touch starved that even while being sexually used, they were still found some form of comfort in the act. But they were still trapped because being women, immigrants who didn't know much English and a minority in a time of growing anti-Asian, especially anti-Japanese sentiment, provided the bride's little, if at all, freedom. They were at the mercy of men and other women who might disdain them for who they are. Because of this, no matter how much they wished for the opposite, the American dream didn't include them. Julio Tsuka's work is mostly universally praised. The Buddha in the Attic won the 2012 Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and was nominated for the 2011 editions of the National Book Award for Fiction and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. The non-Asian specialized critics, such as the New York Times, the The Guardian, and the Washington Post, agree that the first-person plural choice and the stream of consciousness structure of the book makes its writing similar to poetry in its descriptions and word choices. However, the Washington Post criticized the author's repetitive style as limited and the plural voice as blurry and distancing. Ron Charles, the critic, complains that it can make us feel perfectly sad about how these Americans were treated, but it never really ch challenges the prejudice that made their intent possible. On this note, the Asian American magazine Hyphen disagrees. For journalist Manan Desai, the richness of the novel is its critique of racism in the United States culture. In capturing the paradox of American ethos, a land of immigrants, and a land of suspects, the Buddha in the attic does far more than recover this valuable moment in Japanese American history. It gestures toward a broader critique of the national culture of the United States. Therein lies its power. Overall, White's by Julia Tsuka reveals the various forms of prejudice against Japanese-American women in the first half, half of the 20th century. Living in a new and strange land, it details brutal working conditions, both as land workers and maids, as well as the intersection of sexism that these young girls were put through. They came to this country looking for freedom and prosperity, but were instead met with hostility, poor lives, and violence fit for a nightmare.